Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Cybersecurity Sauna. Thanks for joining us for another session where we sweat out the hot topics in security. So welcome to all our listeners and be sure to follow us on Twitter at hashtag CyberSauna. Today we're going to talk about a topic we get a lot of questions on, how to get into the field of information security. Between zero-day news flashes and stunt hacking reports, there are a lot of false conceptions out there about what it's like to be an InfoSec professional. So what is it you need to focus on if you want to get into the world of InfoSec testing or become a security consultant? Joining us to talk about this is Tom, Principal Security Consultant with F-Secure. Tom, why don't you start things off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Just briefly, what do you do in your role? I'm a security consultant. That means that I advise customers on how to better protect themselves against cyber attacks and to identify areas of risk that they might not even know about. That means that we work with the customer to make sure that they're doing the right thing, that they can conduct their business, which is mainly what they're they're best at, uh, where we come with our security expertise to ensure that uh, they're not taking any unnecessary risks when conducting that business. So we're talking about how to get into the InfoSec field. Uh, what kind of jobs are there in the InfoSec uh, industry? Information security is, of course, a very broad term. I would argue that cybersecurity is only part of that because usually cybersecurity deals with things that are electronic, whereas a lot of things are still on paper. But that means that we, uh, in our field, have people who design security systems or design solutions that deal with information that our customers care about. But it also means that uh, whenever that, that setup has been made or those solutions have been created, that we need to verify if actually things are done according to the spec that they were designed for. So that means we need security architects. That means we need security reviewers. We need attack and penetration testers, which is kind of a, a part of that field. Uh, but also people who can actually fix the processes, like you know people who know about risk and security management principles to make sure that companies have all the processes, policies, and the procedures that come with them to make sure that everyone is doing things in the way that uh, they're intended to, uh, to happen. So mostly when we talk about working in the InfoSec, a lot of people think uh, penetration testers, like the actual hackers here. I hear a lot of people asking questions like, I can do this, can I now call myself a hacker? What's your answer to that? Um, but then first we have to kind of look at what does it mean? What does the word hacker actually mean? Right. And of course, there's different meanings to the word hacker. And of course, some of the uh, the media have, have kind of hijacked this uh, meaning, someone who's doing something criminal with you know a computer or a piece of technology. The original meaning, at least to the majority of people in the industry, is that it's someone who is very good at, at a certain aspect of something that could be technology, but it could also be you know non-technological areas. But for the sake of uh, this discussion, it is someone who is extremely good at a certain technical aspect of something being, you know, systems, programming languages, architecture, cryptography, stuff like that, and is able to know the rules of these kinds of systems, if you will, so well that they can actually start bending the rules or adding to it. Because let's not forget, hackers are people who build things. They don't break things. Well, they do break things in the sense that they want to make things better. So a hacker is someone who looks at something and says for himself that there's a certain key feature missing, they will take it apart, put that missing feature in, so to speak, and then put it back together again. That, that's kind of the rough definition of being a hacker. Okay, so you don't need to be doing anything illegal to be a hacker. Absolutely not. Those are, you know, in the industry, we like to call those crackers, but unfortunately, we've, we've kind of lost that battle because hackers, you know, speak more to the mind of the, the general public. But no, uh, you don't have to do anything illegal to learn anything in this, in this field. Mm. There's unfortunately this way of believing that if you commit enough crimes you will kind of come out at the other end and become a really good guy and get hired by, you know, the law enforcement agencies and all that. So that's not the case. So it's actually the opposite of the case in, in most of the countries where we operate. If you have a criminal record, we won't be able to give you a job. Absolutely. Trustworthiness is extremely important when applying for a job, which is, that, which is something that you control as, as an individual. So, you know, there are ways of doing things that are illegal on the internet and of course with the anonymity that that comes with the internet there's a tendency to kind of do more things that you know under the premise of you know i won't get caught you will get caught don't right. do something stupid like that don't resort to criminal activities there's enough things to play with on the internet that are completely for free 
and uh, with you know the coming of the cloud and 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 war games and these kind of hacker games that you can play information is virtually free now so there's a lot of stuff to go into you don't have to resort to any kind of criminal activities because one it's stupid two you simply will not get a job right 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 what worked for uh, kevin mitnick won't work for you unfortunately these are kind of the examples from the 80s and the 90s the, right. the fiber optics the, the the kevin mitnicks and unfortunately because we didn't have any real laws back then those people were kind of made into made into examples mm. but at the same time also a lot of false idols for a lot of people there's still people kind of coasting on on that kind of quote unquote success they had with their criminal activities but again there's other people who have been smarter uh Mitnick is of course the most known example but if you take like a, a kevin polson who also did lots of illegal things uh he was able to turn that around and 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 you know kind of basically turn his life around and use it for his skills for good so to speak yeah but but is it hard like You're a young, inquisitive lad growing up in this world, and uh, you're sort of interested in these sort of things. Is it hard to stay on that right side of the law? Is it hard to know what's legal and what's not? Sometimes, when I mean, there are gray zones, for sure, but there are more... Um, it's not that hard in that you have to just kind of understand what the implications are of what you're doing. Right. So, I mean, yes, you, you can try and you know probe someone else's systems and all that, but they're going to find out. And at the end of the day, you have to figure out for yourself, how does this actually benefit me? What am I going to do with this information? So I would recommend people just to focus on, on the more benign ways of learning things where you can still break software or break hardware, but within the comfort of either your own home or, or with no risk of, of doing anything illegal. Because again, you will get caught one way or the other. And it's just a stupid move because you don't have to take these kinds yeah. of risks. So how do you get into InfoSec in general? You get there by reading a lot and by making sure that you have an overview as to how technology works, how people interact with that technology, and what the risks are of using certain technologies versus what you're trying to achieve with that technology. We are right now in a in a uh, period where anything goes. We have you know people doing weird things with mobile applications and mattresses with Wi-Fi in them and uh, weird appliances with Bluetooth and all kinds of other technological features that might benefit us. But we need people that can sound the alarm bell when businesses are kind of crossing the line. So being able to have that knowledge and being able to use that in a way that other companies can benefit from it as part of a consultancy job means that you are going to have to read a lot, which means you're going to have to learn how to speed read. You're going to have to be able to digest massive amounts of documentation about anything that has to do with technology or how technology is being used. That means the phone in your pocket. That means your computer. That means operating systems. That means programming languages. That means system design. That means cryptography. That means telecom, networking, anything that has to do with technology that makes up the things that we use and that we not just rely on, but basically depend on as human beings. Being able to know the rules of those things and being able to bend them to your own will is kind of what defines a hacker. And if you can actually make that into a model where you can assist other people or basically organizations and companies, then there is a a job for you in the field of information security and more specifically information security testing okay. because there's two sides to the medallion, of course. Sure. Um, are there things that make a good InfoSec consultant compared to a maybe not so good one? Obviously, you want to be informed. Uh, if you go to a customer and the customer asks, this new attack that came out, uh, the crack attack, uh, whatever the latest attack is uh, on, on a major, major piece of technology, If you only have like high level information about that and don't really understand what it's about, then you're not going to be able to help an organization or a company. And with that, you're not going to be able to uh, get any business done at those companies. Um, so you want to stay on top of things. And that can be draining at times. But if you know how to, again, digest a whole bunch of information at once, that means it used to be RSS feeds, now it's Twitter and, and blogs and all kinds of things. If you find a model for yourself and how you can kind of distinguish the, the noise from the, from the signal and get information that is relevant, that you can use to help other people with, not just yourself, then you might be a good profile or get started in information security. Right. So where do you get information? You said read a lot. Um, like where, should I, where do I find this material that I want to read? 
there are certain uh, areas or websites that you can you can go to where you can download you know papers. There are these uh, research groups that always you know it, it kind of depends on your interests as well. If you're really interested into uh, networking or, or or whatever, then you could you know download white, white papers from the, the major technology vendors that are out there. They sometimes have research groups that are producing interesting things. But I would say just find researchers that are researching technology that you're interested in. Mm. And they have different names and different, you know, researchers. These people write usually, you know, articles, they write blog posts, they write, you know, and you shouldn't stay yourself blind onto, you know, maybe a few single posts, but try to get different sides to a single story, a certain vulnerability, a certain because everyone is, of course, trying to... Um, Everyone has a flag, so to speak, or everyone has a certain incentive to report things in a certain way. Uh, you should be kind of agnostic to that in the sense that it's just technology. It's hardware and it's software. So you should go kind of go beyond what we call technological religion. If you don't like people using Amazon products or Apple products, that that's fine, but you should still be able to learn about what that technology does, how it works, what its vulnerabilities might be. And in the end of the day, it's just it's just hardware and software. What about conferences and, and courses and, and stuff like that? Are those worth anything? They are because, I mean, at the end of the day, a lot of this, of the, the information security world is based on the communities. Uh, not just open source communities, but open source technology. Because, of course, you know, if you want to get into, let's say, operating systems or, or, or networking or whatever, you need to see how technology works. And the best way of seeing that work is by, by reading source code. And you cannot read source code from proprietary products, so people kind of flock towards open source projects, which can have higher security than proprietary products, not always, of course. And the people behind those things are the ones to talk to. So when when most of us in the information security uh, kind of world go to these conferences, it is also to see the talks, but mainly to meet other people in the business, to see how they are doing, what technologies they are using, uh, their experiences with, with certain business areas or customers or whatever it is uh, and to learn from those people to see okay you're doing those kinds of developments in, in those kinds of areas that's that's fantastic let's see if we can build on that or or collaborate or these kinds of things because again hackers build things mm. and only through that transparency of knowing what a piece of technology does that's the only way to build any kind of solution that is trustworthy in in these world of you know in this post snowden era of of technology getting backdoored and being misused and abused by by um yeah intelligence agencies and and, and criminals alike and that's really important so but if i don't have any money to go to these conferences and and take those courses and buy expensive software am i out of luck or is there things i can do no absolutely not there's loads of free conferences that you can go to or, or local gatherings in in your in your city and if there's no gathering then you should organize one because there's always, you know, people that are tied to not just universities and other schools, but even people who are no longer or didn't go to university. There's ways of meeting up and just talking about security. And these meetings are free. There's this concept called CitySec, where people kind of organize uh, a little gathering in a bar or in a restaurant somewhere. There's no RSVP. You don't have to announce your presence. You go there, you have a drink, you talk about security or things that interest you. And if you start getting bored, if you don't like it anymore, then you go home. Yeah, I, and I guess like being the guy, being known as the guy who organizes this event in your town won't actually uh, hinder your progress in the intro world Absolutely either. Absolutely not. And uh, not only that, but you can actually figure out what other people are into. Again, you want to be, you don't want to be the smartest guy in the room. It's always nice and humbling to go to someone saying, I don't know anything about what you are into when it comes to technology, when it comes to anything. Could you give me some books or some titles that I could get into or how do I get into this field? So you don't want to be the smartest guy in the room. It actually uh, is a very humbling experience to kind of relearn or be a beginner in new fields mm. because not only will you learn from yourself because you might get frustrated that you're not picking up as fast as you wanted to but also you can you can gain more perspective in the things that you already knew about where you might be suffering from a little bit of you know tunnel vision so when you're talking to somebody who wants to work in infosec field what's a good background to have your background doesn't really matter that much i would say most of the people that i work with or have worked with um, have had very little formal education. Uh, most of them are self-taught. And again, with the uh, amount of information that is available right now to learn about how the world works in the world of technology, but not just technology, processes and, and, and anything um, relating to those, 
you don't really need a formal education in, for example, computer science, but it definitely helps. So most people that apply now for jobs have some kind of background in computer science because that's kind of what they were interested in. And if they want to get some kind of degree or diploma, that, that would be the way to do it. But it certainly isn't a prerequisite. Uh, there's a lot of people who are self-taught who have taken the time to teach themselves new things and to constantly keep themselves new, uh, teach themselves new things. Um, but the, the risk you might be running is that people only focus on the exams and the tests rather than the actual gathering of knowledge about how something works. Because for people in the information security industry, it doesn't end at five o'clock, so to speak. You keep reading, you keep trying to keep up with the things that are happening in the world. You know, tests and scores and all that don't really matter that much. Mm. What about certifications? Do those help? Uh, they can certainly help, but it's more the knowledge that you gain while getting the certificate that actually matters. And one has to one has to question the world of certifications to saying, can you attain the same level of knowledge without going for a certification? So yes, there are some certifications that might help you in getting a job or getting a better job. Some are based on certain areas, like for example, penetration testing. Uh, others are more general that deal with kind of the, the, the general domains of information security. So it certainly helps to be able to show that you are able to finish something, but it is not a prerequisite. Sure. So we talked about the technical requirements for the for this job, but um, what are the, some of the soft skills you need as a consultant? Well, obviously, if you can be the most uh, badass hacker or security researcher in the world, if you cannot explain your findings or cannot explain where you might find flaws in a system or cannot explain how you would make things better, then you're going to fail. So being able to communicate these kinds of things, being able to write executive English, because you know this world, most organizations still have English as the main language. Those are certainly skills that you would need on top of just basic presentation skills, making sure that you, you, know, you have a, a beginning, a middle, and an end to whatever it is that you're presenting. Being able to um, gauge or measure the impact of what it is that you're writing, because you have to be you have to have some some kind of sense of responsibility when you're disclosing certain things or when you find something that is, let's say, less than desirable. You want to make sure that the, the required parties know it first versus, you know, your colleagues, the world, your friends, etc. So being able to maintain a certain level of trustworthiness, being able to tie what the organization or company that you're working for, tying what they need with what they want. That those are some of the skills that you can only learn on the job. And that is where, I mean, to get an entry job into information security, you need to have a lot of focus on those things as well, and on top of the technical skills. But getting a point across is something you can practice like with your friends or parents or... Sure, I mean, there's, there's organizations where you can actually practice your own, you know, presentation skills mm. or just making a slide deck, which a lot of people get wrong most of the time. Just getting your message across and making sure that you don't uh, go off on a tangent uh, and, and in certain details that might not matter for your target audience. Making sure that you actually are talking to your target audience and not just trying to fulfill your own personal agenda. These are things you can practice yourself, either with friends or with family even, uh, but also in certain, you know, let's say, like I mentioned, certain security meetups where people do like these little lightning talks. So a lot of conferences have room for you know, lightning talks that are free to give where you can just go through a topic that interests you in about five minutes. Uh, it's kind of a, you know, a lightning round kind of thing where you can fail fast. And that's what you want to be able to learn. You need to learn how to fail fast. So what are some other traits or uh, characteristics or core values that are helpful or useful in an InfoSec professional? Well, you're going to be working in a team, which means you need to learn how to work with other people. And that sounds easier than it is because everyone has their own way of working. So you need to have some ground rules when it comes to communication, when it comes to cooperation, when it comes to complementing your, your colleagues, because everyone will have a certain core strength. So being able to combine those as part of a team is extremely important. Being able to assist your colleagues when um, they need help and making sure that you're all aligned with what it is that you're trying to do for a certain organization to make sure that they have what they need and that you actually can provide value to them, again, rather than just playing and, and fulfilling your personal agenda. 
So always keeping the objective in mind is extremely important. Being able to communicate is extremely important, but also more basic things that we all take for granted. Punctuality, being able to be a trustworthy party in a way that you are actually tailoring whatever it is that you know towards your customer and to keep it as as realistic as and, and pragmatic as possible. Sure. Um, so being able to pick your battles is extremely important. So let's say I have all this uh, this training, these skills, this passion, this um, everything I need to be a successful infosec professional. How do I make a presence? How do I get noticed by the the companies? Whatever research you're doing or whatever you're into, it's very easy nowadays to make kind of a small brand of yourself. So. I mean, setting up a, a, a blogging website or a Twitter account and just publishing or writing about what you what your experiences are with technology or processes or how the world works is very easy to do. So you have to put yourself out there. That doesn't mean you have to show your head at expensive conferences or spend a lot of money. Most of the things nowadays are free. So just doing research or taking toys apart or questioning certain things or interacting with, with companies or, or, or organizations that might not be doing what they're supposed to be doing just learn how to write, put yourself out there. Uh, I meant, you know, like blogs, Twitter, social media in general. And that kind of serves as your portfolio because that shows me if you, if, you know, if you have, if you're applying for a job at F-Secure, I mean, the first thing we're going to do is to see what have, what have you written? Not just in code on your, maybe your GitHub account, but also how do you see the world? Uh, are you actually active in the domain of information security? Because in the end, that's what we want. And that's what our customers are paying for ultimately. So you're interviewing a candidate for a job. What are some of the questions you ask? We usually ask, for example, what does your lab look like? And that sounds really official, but that could just be a refurbished potato laptop with a bunch of virtual machines on them. So what are you looking to hear when you ask that? Well, hopefully that person is installing lots of different operating systems to run tests with so they can play with technology in a way they're not you know, constrained to a certain architecture or vendor or whatever. So we want to make sure that those people are actually doing things outside of the box, not just thinking outside the box, are actually playing with technology, are automating things, uh, these kinds of things. So we ask them about, do you enjoy programming? Do you enjoy automating things? Do you enjoy taking things apart and seeing how they work? Do you like to add features to certain things that weren't supposed to be there? We ask them about uh, certain things about their favorite operating systems and um, if they enjoy working with networking and mobile phones and anything that has to do with, with technology. And kind of how people talk about it, about their home projects, about that thing they automated or their home demotica system or stuff like that. Then we can really get a sense of, is this person interested in technology? Are they interested in the technology aspects? But also, most importantly, are they interested in building things? which again is very important because breaking things is one thing, fixing them is another. We ask them how some of the vulnerabilities they've come across in whatever technology they're using uh, and how they found them uh, because sometimes you can get lucky, but usually you want to be more than lucky when you're working for corporate customers. So you want to have some kind of basic methodology, a list of things that you do for every single thing that you come across that you want to find vulnerabilities in or weaknesses or, or things like that. And I'm, and based on that, we can get a pretty good picture as to what kind of person we have in front of us. Are they able to kind of project that enthusiasm onto us as, as, a, as a target group, so to speak, because then we know that they can do the same thing for companies to make sure that they have what they need and to see if this person can, can one, have, has the, have the technical skills and two, communicate. You get into the InfoSec game. You do the, the job for a couple of years, but you decide it's not for you you want to move on to other things. What are some of the things people go to when they're done with penetration testing? There's a lot of people who um, kind of transition towards becoming a chief information security officer, CISO. There are people who go into the IT or security architect business, trying to design secure solutions, knowing about what can go wrong and what kind of flaws uh, there might be. There are people who take up kind of a certain interest that is part of their job. I mean, being into, into information security means that you're in contact with operating systems, programming languages, uh, system administration, network administration, these kinds of things. And certain people kind of go back to how they got into information security, which could be having a developer grab background and going back to that or administrating systems or, or things like that. 
So there's lots of um, different tangents you can go into if you get tired of information security or penetration testing specifically. Is there good money in this industry? Can I provide for my family being an InfoSec consultant? Uh, absolutely. But the only limitation you'll have there is your own knowledge and your own motivation. So you have to be driven in this field because it's a very fast moving world. Not everyone is always able to keep up and the days are over when everyone knew everything about anything. So you kind of have to pick what technologies you want to really want to get into or become a specialist in, be it mobile applications, be it cryptography, be it whatever. Because, I mean, the best profiles that we see in the world of information security are people that can not only see the world very holistically and, and, and wide, but also are able to drill down t very deep technically. So you want to be a profile, kind of a hybrid profile between those two worlds uh, and have some kind of focus because there's too much stuff out there. It, it's, it's just the world is too big uh, when it comes to information security. So you're going to have to pick a few target areas, stick with those, uh, and then see where, where it takes you. That is some sound advice. Um, I want to thank you very much, Tom, for, uh, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. And I hope this uh, podcast has been helpful for the young guys and, and people looking into getting into InfoSec field because I can absolutely guarantee the companies are hiring and they are looking for you. That was our show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and you can reach us with questions and comments on Twitter through FSecure with the hashtag CyberSauna. Thanks for listening.